turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to How's everybody doing tonight? Some people are excited to be here. That's awesome. Uh, A couple announcements, please be in prayer for the people that went to Honduras. I keep wanting to say Guatemala. It's not Guatemala. It's Honduras. They did land safe, right? I saw on Facebook. So they landed safe. So we're good on that. Um, Announcements. Mr. Hank is going to give some announcements. Oh. Just as a reminder, I see there's not very many men here at all, but uh, we do have a men's, a men's retreat coming up on the 11th to 13th up in Blanco, Texas. Make sure you bring what's required on the little handout out there when you come up there. We also have men's meetings that are every first Tuesday and every third Saturday of the month, uh, which we'd like everybody to attend. Uh, Mike usually attends too. See, I probably, everybody that's here usually comes to the men's meeting, so it's, it's no big deal. One guy here, we may get him to start coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Blanco. Blanc, yeah, Blanco, no, Texas. it's Blanco. Blanco. Blanco, <laughs> Texas. <laughs> well, thank you for being here tonight. Why don't you stand and let's pray. I don't know of any other announcements, so we're just going to end on that one. That's a good one. Lord, Father, we just thank you, God, for an opportunity to meet here in this place. And I thank you, Father, for, Lord, this church. Lord, and I thank you, Father, for its people that hunger and thirst after righteousness. I thank you. Father God, that you give us an opportunity to hear your word. And Lord, we're going to lift up a mighty praise tonight. Lord, I thank you that Matt Hammerski is here to speak, and I pray that you give him the words to speak. Lord, open up our hearts. Let Let us be doers of your word, not just hearers, is my prayer, God. We worship you in this place. Lord, all, all we have tonight, all we're going to bring you tonight is a hallelujah. From the most inner parts of our hearts, God, we give a hallelujah. Lord, when we don't have the words to speak, Lord, when, when we don't have the songs to sing, God, we bring our hallelujah in the midst. When we're on the mountaintops and the valleys, God, we're going to worship you. We choose to worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. So find us here and let this be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. In Jesus' name. Sure, I've got 
you turn graves into gardens you're the only one who can you're the only one who can you're the only one who can you're the only one we lift our voice to you Shout. 
your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Trust him. 
to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus. Trust this Jesus, amen. You can trust him. You know, we fail each other sometimes, don't we? But this Jesus, we can trust him. You can trust this Jesus. He's so good to us. He's so good to us. Why not? Why not trust this precious Jesus? He's proven his love for us by dying on the cross. Why not trust this Jesus? Father, if anybody in this place tonight is struggling with trusting you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just come and surround them, Father. Let your love woo them into trusting you. We thank you very much for the cross, Lord. We thank you for the work of the cross. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. We stand here, Father, we can lift up our hands and say thank you. Thank you for the blood. We are free because of the blood. Thank you. Lord, we love you. And I just ask that your spirit will keep his hands all over the service for the remaining of the service, just like it has been. I pray that you anoint Matt as, he begin, as, he, as he's going to speak to us tonight. I pray that he hear from heaven, Lord, and speak only your words. We love you, Jesus. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to have my brother Matt come up here. I'll tell you a funny story about Matt. Uh, Matt, Matt, Bethany, and I, we kind of grew up together, kind of the same youth group. Um, when we were growing up, I think I was in high school, and I think you were in junior high for the most part. You, yeah, yeah, so... He was kind of in that transition point. And I remember this. I was thinking about the story the other day. I, was, I remember we, I was invited to come play football. Remember that? I don't know, this is a funny story. I was invited to play football with the youth group, right? And so all the guys were showing up. And we were having fun playing and stuff. And, I, you know, Matt was on the other team. And I was on, you know, the opposite team. And somewhere in the communication, I heard that we were playing tackle. But nobody else heard that, right? And it just so happens that Matthew got the ball, and I was playing tackle, and he was not. See, at that point, he was in junior high, and I was in high school, right? And so I remember going, and I wrapped my hand, my arm just like they taught me, right? And I just did whatever I could to get, get him to the ground. And I remember the youth pastor was so mad at me, and he was threatening me. He's like, oh, I know how to hurt people, too, and all this stuff. I don't know if you remember any of this. And... and Jonathan was not happy, 
and that because that's his boy, you know. I just showed up with one of the girls to play football, and that's his boy. And uh, needless to say, I don't think I want to play football with Matt anymore. <laughs> so I love you, man. I love you, man. Appreciate that. I was gonna say, anytime you just bring it on back. <laughs> Now, yeah, I remember that story, actually, now that you've mentioned that. And uh, it wasn't that I was Jonathan's boy. It's that Jonathan knew the wrath of my mother, Donna Hammerski. (laughs) And you didn't play with anybody that belonged to Donna Hammerski. So, (laughs) yeah, that's all that was. You know, it's funny. I actually had a memory. I was just thinking during worship as uh, Bethany was leading us. And then I saw y'all's beautiful girl lead, too, which was so powerful and amazing. I love seeing children lead in worship. Amen. That's wonderful. Um, But... It reminded me of when we lost our youth pastor. We were without, you remember this? I know you remember this, Bethany. And, and we were like, well, we'll just have to stop services until we find another one. And I remember Bethany was like, we can do it. And I was like, do, do what? <laughs> she was like, lead the youth group. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> and so that's what we did for several, I mean, for a couple of months. We just, we kept having service and God showed up and it made, I mean, we didn't really, yeah, 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 Guillermo preached. Yeah, Guillermo preached. I remember that. And we were playing the music. I mean, we did it all. And, and, and it's funny, we all do ministry today, so that's hilarious. But, uh, <laughs> So anyway, you know, just step up and lead, you know. Those kind of uh, situations of adversity and tough times expose leaders. That's one thing I've learned, uh, people that will step up and lead um, and lead in love. Um, You know, I was just thinking about the firm foundation that is Jesus, um, where we should be rooted and how we should be rooted in community. There is no greater time, I think, than the time we are right now in history that we need to know the word of God that we need to be truly rooted in the word of God and in Jesus, but really, really also so important, rooted with one another, rooted in true community and true family, that we're there for each other. We hold each other up when we grow tired. We hold each other up when we're scared, when we don't know what's going on in the world. As you can look around today, I I, I just find it, I find it humorous because I think, you know, the enemy loves to use fear. That's the tactic he uses for everything. He uses fear. And, and people that like to operate in making people scared and use fear, they're, they're, they're his children. You know, they, they like to use fear to motivate. Uh, and fear is, it's a, it's a decent motivator, but it never lasts. It, it'll never last. Love is the ultimate motivator. When you do things out of love, you will continue. You see, often people, people give up on their church family because they stop loving them. That's all it is. People walk away from their marriage because they stop loving them. See, often I've, 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 at this point, I've, I've counseled I don't know how many men in their marriages, uh, men younger than me, men much older than me. Uh, doesn't really matter your age, <laughs> right? Uh, anybody can be mature. Anybody can be a fool. Uh, I've seen that on full display. And uh, it doesn't matter. Every time I pretty much say the same thing. I wonder if they've ever gotten together and talked about the, the counsel they've ever received from me. But my counsel to men all the time is you just need to love your wife better. And it's always, well, she does this, that, yeah. But if you loved her better, she wouldn't. <laughs> and you see, you know, it, it, it's true. You just, just love her better. Why? Because there's power in love. See, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Many times we think, well, if I do better at keeping his commands, he, I, he will love me more. Somehow we get that twisted. But he started with, if you love me. You will keep my commands. Well, what does that mean? That means the power is in the loving. The power is when we begin to really love Jesus. We begin to truly walk with Jesus. We truly begin to serve Jesus. We don't want to grieve the heart of Jesus. Why? Because we love him. And it's really that simple. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Just loving someone, walking with them at the pace that they're walking at. Walking hand in hand with someone that you're in relationship with with truly loving them. You know, I sat down with a young man and he was just telling me, man, I'm just trying this and that and I just keep stumbling, I keep failing and I keep falling and I keep doing all these things and I try to uphold God's commands and then I just fall for this or I mess up and I fall and I do that and I do this. I'm just horrible. I'm this awful person. And he just, I mean, he's really, he's at this point, he's in tears. I mean, he is just frustrated. And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me. He's done with all this, right? Snot everywhere. He's, he's cried. He's told me everything that he's done wrong. I mean, he's confessed many sins and just sitting there with him for about 10 minutes. And he looks at me like I'm going to give him some kind of like long, thought out, deep answer. And you know what I told him? I said, you're trying too hard. He looked at me. He was like, what? And I said, I said, do you believe God loves you? 
He was like, well, I mean, no, not really. I was like, let me ask you this. When you mess up, when you make a mistake, do you believe God loves you less? Well, I mean, dude, don't you? Yeah. Well, there's your problem. See, when we know how God thinks about us, we know how God feels about us, it changes us when we really believe that there is nothing better than him. There is nothing stronger than him. I don't how, care how scary uh, a crazy dictator might seem, but there's nothing greater than our God. See, he's already won the victory. Everybody right now that's not on Team Jesus is just fighting for first place to be the first loser. Okay? <laughs> We've already won. And sometimes, sometimes I get this crazy idea that maybe, maybe we have more faith in what the enemy can do rather than faith in what God has already done. Rather than believing in the victory that we already have. See, when you know you've already won, there's a confidence. When you know you win, you can watch everything break out in chaos and know that, well, I win. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what this country is doing. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter what's going on here. I have already won. And he's given me a mission. And that mission is to walk like him, to invite heaven to invade earth, to be here, to show Jesus to the world, to be the arms and feet of Jesus. And I can't do it alone. We were meant to do it together. We were meant to show the love of Jesus together in community. So I've been in this series uh, with our church. We kicked off the year with this series, and I was praying. This is something God has been just walking me through for the last several months uh, about my pace, my pace of life, uh, how I live life. See, God calls us, he invites us to this life, uh, this law of Christ, right, this way of living to, to imitate Jesus, to follow Jesus, to become like Jesus, to die and be hidden in Jesus, right? I love Paul makes that crazy statement where he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So you could read that and think, oh man, this Paul guy is super arrogant, right? But no, because then you continue to read on and you'll see, he says the, the, he's like the chief of sinners. If you look at his past, it's terrible. And if God can forgive him, he surely can forgive you. So what does that mean? Paul wasn't boasting in himself. He has that much confidence at the work that Christ has done in his life. He has that much confidence in what Christ is doing in his life that he boasts in his weakness because he knows it brings greater glory to Jesus. Because you're about to watch him be faithful. Even in times of suffering, you're going to watch him be faithful. Why? Not because of his strength, but because of God's strength. By the grace of God. I love that song we just sing, oh, for grace to trust you more. Like, God, I can't even trust you more without your grace. Like, I can't even have faith without you giving me grace. The faith I have is from you. You're the author and the finisher of my faith. And I think sometimes we get this idea that maybe we can just work it up enough, or if we do better, like, God will love us more somehow. No, he loves you so much right now in the state you're in. And if you receive that love, it will change you. See, I've seen God do some amazing things, but it all changed when I finally stopped running, stopped trying to strive and do things on my own, manipulate things to make them happen the way I thought they should happen. I remember God gave me promises that he was going to do in my life, and I thought, well, if I can just work it out, if I could just make it happen, I'll help God. Anybody ever try to help God before? Yeah, that's a mistake. <laughs> Don't worry, though. You're not alone. The Bible's full of people like that. They tried to help God. <laughs> right? And they just spawned big, big problems. That's okay. We're not alone. But as soon as I really surrendered, as soon as I began to believe that God really loves me, that he would send his son to die for me, for me, knowing full well there would be those that would not serve him. And he did it anyway. See, he says, while we were still sinners, Christ died. He didn't wait for us to get better. And it's interesting to me that sometimes in church we can fall into that trap of saying, well, when you're better, you can then come in. Well, if you get it together, then we can use you. And I don't see that modeled for us in Scripture. So we've been talking about this series called Rooted, what it looks like. It's called The Deeply Formed Life. And as I was praying about uh, what to share with our church, I really feel like this is actually kind of a word really for, I mean, definitely for me. I know, I know God's bring correction in my life, but for our church and for the church as a whole about being rooted. And you can see is the way the world's going right now. Uh, if you are not rooted in a firm foundation, you ain't going to make it. 
You're not going to make it. That's the beauty about storms is they will expose what you're built on. When the storm comes, you will really see what your foundation is. You know, I, I recently um, had to um, uh, officiate my, my grandma's funeral. It was a couple weeks ago. And um, my grandpa had already passed away a few years b- before this. And, and I had to officiate her fu- funeral a couple weeks ago. And I was at the church that was their home church. And um, the, it was uh, what's it, Northside Assembly of God, hallelujah, in, uh, there in Crowley, Louisiana. And uh, I found out all these stories, and every time I hear more stories about how my, my grandfather helped put on the roof of the church, how when they built the new building, he helped put in the foundation, that he would do all this stuff. He would take time off of work and serve and pour into the church, and how so many people looked up to him. He was like a pillar in the church. And then I found out, uh, officiating her funeral, I found out the pastor uh, that would been there probably for like 30 years, he announced that my grandparents were members of that church for 70 years. 70 years. You want to talk about rooted. You want to talk about not moving. <laughs> Committed to the same family of faith for 70 years. It's rare to even see that anymore. In fact, it's rare to see even pastors stick with their congregation longer than six or seven years. We have to get back, family, to being rooted in Christ, being rooted with one another. See, the question you've got to ask yourself is, did God call me here to Central Assembly? Did God call me here? Because if he did, that's all you need. That's it. And see, sometimes we leave because it gets difficult. But see, family doesn't bail on family when it gets hard. We stick together. We work it through. We have a saying in our church that as long as you continue to come to the table, there's nothing we can't work through. And so I would encourage you in that. Stop looking for excuses to leave and say, God, change me. Show me what I need to do. Show me how do I walk forward in love with the situation that's going on. I don't know where that came from. I don't have that written down, so just take that for what it's worth. But be willing to work through tough times. Be willing to come to the table. Colossians 2, 2 through 7 says this, I want their hearts to be encouraged and join together in love. This is Paul writing, and he says, so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. Now, I want to read that part just again real quick. I want their hearts to be encouraged and join together in love. Okay, so we're rooted together, right? So that they may have all the riches in complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. I want you to understand, if you are not plugged into a community, you are not experiencing the fullness of Christ. I didn't say it, Paul did. I want you to be rooted together in love. Why? So you can experience the fullness of Christ, of the mystery, Christ. See, the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ. Not just you, not just me, we have the mind of Christ. Together, we have the mind of Christ. We need each other. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, something we could use a lot more of today, amen? I am saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are in the strength of your faith in Christ. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, here we go, being rooted and built up in him and established in the face, just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. I want to tell you something. I can identify someone who is rooted in Christ. I can identify someone who is rooted in community and love because they have a thankful heart. They are a grateful people. See, complaining is a language for unbelief. People that are not thankful typically are not rooted. And if they are somewhere, I guarantee you, they have what I like to call the scorner's seat somewhere in the church. They like to mock. They like to gossip. They like to complain about everything that they don't like. They're critical. Not rooted in love. So, so then be built up, overflowing with gratitude. So what does it look like to be rooted? There's something I, I, I find really interesting. Uh, how many of you know about the Redwoods in, in California? Anybody know the Redwoods? Cool. They're beautiful, right? I mean, it's just incredible. I don't know if you've ever been able to go to the Redwoods and see them, but they're breathtaking. I haven't been. My wife's been able to go. She tells me they're awesome. But I haven't gone in person, but they look amazing, right? They can grow for over 240 feet tall, these Redwood trees. You know, they found something early on. They began to cut them down uh, because they discovered that, wow, this makes great furniture. So they started cutting them down, and they realized when they would cut down one tree, the tree closest to it would start to lean. And they were like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> right? And then they cut down another tree, and then another tree on the other side there would start to lean. 
And then they figured out that the root system for the redwoods only goes six feet down. They grow 240 feet tall. The root system goes six feet down. Now, see what, if you could look under the soil and see what, what was happening was all of these redwood trees are actually connected together. The roots don't go super deep, but they are all entangled in one another. So when you take one away, the rest lean. They need each other. So I believe when we talk about being rooted, I like to think of the redwoods because this is how God has designed us. That we are to be rooted together in Christ, but together, entwined, right? Our lives living life together, you know, walking with one another even when it gets tough. Why? Because when the storms come, we don't move. And guess what? You might not have a lot of time to go very deep in your theology of Jesus, but if you get plugged into a community that's already deep, guess what? You get locked in. You start to say, oh, it's getting crazy. It's all right. You're connected. We got you. We'll hold up your arms. It's cool. You can freak out. It's fine. Go ahead, scream. It's all right. All right? We, we, we got it. We are regularly being formed and influenced by the pace, the noise, and the patterns of this world. That's why the scripture tells us do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Do not be conformed by this world. Why? Because the world is actively trying to conform you. Do, do, do you understand that? Do you see how they, they're trying to get you to live at their pace? They want you to be in a hurry. Right now, what's going on? The world is frantic, right? Well, where are we going to get oil from? All right, we should have done this, should have done that. Oh, everything is a dumpster fire, okay, right? You, I mean, I've got people texting me all the time. It's revelation, right? I got, I got so many pastor friends who are like, here it is. The bear has come out, and you see here. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> it's okay. But it's happening. Oh, okay. It's what's happening. The, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to roar, and, and we win. <laughs> I'm not scared. <laughs> I still have a mission, <laughs> and... Right? I haven't checked out, right? I'm, I'm still locked in. And so we, we, we look at this, though. The world is trying to get us to speed up. And see, to be deeply formed is to come back to a different kind of rhythm, a rhythm marked by communion, by reflection, and a life-giving pace that enables us to offer our presence to the present moment. See, sometimes you get in such a hurry, you can't be present in moments that matter. Sometimes you're so exhausted from all the striving you've been doing when there's a moment you really need to be present, you can't be. Some of us in our family and at homes, maybe we work so much that when we're home, we're not really home. We're exhausted and we can't be present. It's important that we live a different rhythm. I like to call it a rhythm of rest because this is how God calls us to live. He calls us to live from our rest. See, and that's hard for us in the West, right? Because the more you think about it, like, well, the harder you work, the more rewards you get. You can rest, right, after you've worked, right? But the Bible doesn't describe the way life works in Christ that way at all. He says, he says no, 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 you work from that rest. You work from your position in Jesus. You're not trying to earn it. You've already got it. <laughs> now you just learn how to walk in it, <laughs> right? This is why discipleship is important. This is why having your mind renewed daily is so important. It's learning how to walk in these things that he's given you Already, we're able to be present in the moment we need to be in. See, we're formed by a culture fashioned by shallowness, by being shallow. I want you to think about right now social media, right? We all want to get the quick highlight reel up on social media. We're all comparing our lives to someone else's highlight reel. We're comparing our life to something that's fake. Listen, I, I've been at big ministry events. I've been at things, and I've seen pastors that are like, they're doing this. and like, hey, feel me saying this. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, it looks good. Just trying to, just trying to get the word out there, brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? What? what? <laughs> right? But we, we do. We think, well, we need to be seen like this, and, and we need to have more followers, and I need to do what's trending. So people, even if what's trending is completely stupid, I need to do it anyway, right? So I can be seen. <laughs> We're shallowly formed. And the world is rushing, moving ever faster. We get, man, the other day I was literally, so I have, I now have 5G uh, ultra wide, whatever that means. I, I don't know. I guess the, the signal is wider. I, I don't know. It makes it faster. Anyway, so I'm, I'm watching something, right? And I'm kind of going and we were driving. And then all of a sudden I dropped to LTE and I was like, what is this nonsense? LTE. <laughs> and then I started to remember what it was like when I had 3G. 
And when we first got 3G, we thought, wow, this is so fast, right? And then when y'all first, you know, some of you in here, when dial-up first hit, you were like, wow, look at this. Harold, get in here. There's a picture loading on the screen. It's amazing, right? But we've been fashioned to expect things now. And so waiting on the Lord is a foreign concept. We think, well, if we move faster, we're getting more done. We think, here, here it is, we think if we're more productive, that we're, we're doing more. But yet it's being in his presence that makes us productive. It's working from his strength that makes us productive. We're being shallowly formed. All of this steals our joy and peace and causes us not to want to endure hard thing, but settle for quick results. If something gets hard, we don't want to stick it out. We want, we want it to be good now. Let, let me have it now. See, what would it look like for our lives to truly be defined by joy and rest? Because that's what life is described as when walking in Christ. Full of joy and rest. And see, you got to think, well, sometimes the world's in turmoil, right? And sometimes we have things coming against us. But yet the Bible tells us, I can still have joy. I can still have peace. Some of us were too quick to give away our joy. God says, no, you can keep it. <laughs> He said, well, this is a bad situation, so I can't be joyful. Who told you that? Somebody lied to you, <laughs> and you believed it. It was probably fear. Well, I, uh, uh, can't be, can't be. No, it belongs to you in peace that passes understanding. See, this is what it looks like to not be striving all the time and having to somehow make it back to the source before we die, but rather living from the source with constant reminders of his goodness and his faithfulness. I've seen, look, I, I've been pastoring uh, teenagers and now adults for quite some time, and I see people in their walks with Jesus do the same thing, and I've done it over and over again myself. And it's we walk away from the source, we kind of load up, right? We get a special service, or we go hear a special speaker, or Dr. Luke Coulter comes in and gives you a prophetic word, hey, and then, and then we go out on that. And we're like, yeah, God is good. God is good. God is good. And then two weeks later, we're like, ah, ah, and you just climb back into the church and you barely make it to the altar and get you something to drink. When you can be living from the source, overflowing. You know, it was funny. I was at a church that um, I was uh, asked to leave from. Uh, interesting story. But anyway, I was there for about two years. And I remember uh, probably like six months in, I said, well, you know, I, I shared in our staff chapel because we each would have to preach in our staff chapel. And I shared, well, um, you know, God calls us to live from a place of overflow. God calls us to live from his. He never runs out. Like we're called to live from that place of overflow. <laughs> and literally some of the, the elder staff there laughed at me. And, and said, oh, yeah, if only that's how it worked. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then I was asked to leave. But it's a different story. <laughs> we must live from the source. We are meant to live a life of overflow. Look, I'm not condemning you. I'm saying you're trying too hard. Just start loving Jesus and watch that change you. Just start truly loving your brother and sister in faith and walking with people for real, and helping hold up people's arms when they're struggling. And watch, watch the joy that you get. And watch how tight-knit you become, and, and how it, it doesn't matter how tight everybody gets and how, how close we get, there's still room for more to come to the table because the table just keeps getting bigger because God has unlimited resources. So what would it look like living from the source? See, as long as we remain enslaved to a culture of speed, superficiality, and distraction, we will not be the people God longs for us to be. We desperately need a spirituality that roots us in a different way, a different way of life that Jesus invites us to. See, if we want to connect with God, we need to travel at his speed. See, I hear about that running the race. Are you really running the race if you're not running at his pace, though? That's my question. We need to travel at his speed. God has all the time in the world. I want you to think about this. God is outside of time. Sometimes this messes with our head a little bit. God is outside of time. He's seen the beginning and the end. Okay? He's outside of time. Do you think he's in a hurry? Why would he be? <laughs> so why are you? He's not in a hurry. Sometimes we think God's just like, come on, 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 come on. 
The only thing he's, he's in a hurry to is to give you good gifts. He's like, hey, take it. I want you to have it. And you're just kind of like, oh, no, I haven't earned it yet. <laughs> no, I got to do better, God, and then I can receive. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> right? It's that carnal nature, man, that carnal mind. It fights us. It, it fights against us. It tries to prevent us from walking in that joy and that fulfillment that Jesus brings. See, it's a different way of life. Over them. So I want to ask you this. Are you exhausted? Because if you're exhausted, maybe it's your pace. <laughs> maybe it's the pace you're moving at because maybe you're not moving at God's pace. You know, it, you know uh, Guillermo, come here. Come here. Give me, come give me a hand. I want, to, I want to do this real quick. Um, so let, let's see. This is good. So Guillermo's going to play the role of God. Oh, right here, okay? Yeah, that's great. So God, here, here it is. God's walking, and this is what I think it looks like sometimes. Let's go over here. I know this isn't the sweet spot. I might cut out. But, okay, so I just want you to walk a very slow, casual pace, okay? And see, this is what it can look like sometimes. We say, we want to get closer to God. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to be closer to God. I just, God, I just want to know what you're doing. And Lord, I just want to be going in the direction that you want me to go in. And God, if you, hey, slow down. <laughs> Wasn't that ridiculous? Thanks, Guillermo. But that's what your walk with Jesus can look like. Instead of actually come back, Guillermo. This is how it's supposed to look. Ready? Let's walk. <sighs> Today was tough. I'm so glad you're with me. Oh, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> see? But see what happens in the midst of Thanks, Guillermo. Appreciate you. <laughs> what happens in the midst of that? is we get exhausted, we get burned out. I've even said this myself, I'm just burned out. I'm burned out doing ministry. I'm burned out serving the Lord. But see, the Bible tells us that we won't grow weary in doing good if we're in him. So if I've grown weary, where am I pulling my resources from? Am I tapped into him or am I tapped into myself? Because a lot of times burnout does happen and you know what it is? It's you reaching the end of you. Source. There it is. Came back. God was like, you're done. It's only, I love this quote from N.T. Wright. He says this. He says, it's only when we slow down that we can catch up to God. It's only when we slow down. You know, yesterday I do this thing now where I sit before the Lord and I don't say anything. I just focus on Jesus. I don't say anything. Some of you are like, that would drive me crazy. Just sit. Don't say anything. Don't read anything. Just think on the Lord. And can I tell you, those are the best times. The other day, I was sitting on my back porch, and I got one of those cool, like, rocking, you know, the, the launchers that spread out, and they rock? Dude, those things are amazing. I was sitting in one of those, and just, I had read a little bit of the word, and I just decided to stop, and, and I was just hearing the wind blow, and I just started focusing on Jesus, not saying anything, just picturing him. And I just began to feel God's presence just come over me. And the thing I was worried about before, it was gone. Didn't matter why his presence changes our perspective. But sometimes we just got to shut up. Sometimes you think you got to say everything. He already knows it all. Connect with him. Just be with him. So there's this idea that I've been teaching our church, and it's called practicing presence. So it's simply remembering God is present in every moment and making your heart available to him, turning your focus toward him. There's a guy named Brother Lawrence. He was a 17th century monk, and he wrote a book about this called Practicing the Presence of God. And that's what he, now, now obviously, I want you to think about this. He's a monk, so he's in a monastery, and surely there's plenty of silence, right? There's no, not many distractions happening up there at the monastery. Nobody's throwing a big rager or anything like that, right? Nobody's updating their Facebook, okay? So he's not distracted at all by anything that we normally be. But the thing is, is we can tap into the presence of God and to his rest at any moment of the day, any time. You don't have to say an official prayer. You don't have to get down and close your eyes. And especially if you're driving, don't do that, right? Keep the eyes open. But you can connect with the Lord anywhere. Why? Because he's present in every moment. Even in the moments you don't want him to be. He's present. So it's constantly turning our attention to the Lord and saying, God, I recognize you're here. I open my heart to you. Is there something that I can do? Do you want me to do something here? Is there somebody I can minister to? I'm about to walk into this gas station. Lord, would you have me share the love of God with someone? Right? And all of a sudden, little things like stopping at the gas station become these miracle moments. Why? Because you're turning your attention to the presence of God. You're practicing presence. 
It's a discipline. It's a way of life. It's reminding yourself, wait a minute. God is present in this moment. I'm sitting waiting for jury duty. This is terrible. This is like the worst thing ever. But wait, God's present in this moment. Turning my heart to him. See, that's where uh, Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, he says this. He says, pray constantly. That's it. That's, that's literally the verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray constantly. I, man, this, this verse used to give me fits. I used to think, how is that even possible? Pray constantly. Well, here's the thing. Paul's talking about practicing presence. That in every moment, we're connected to Holy Spirit. That he is our life. He is what is giving us life. So he is there in every moment. So we realize when we're starting to rush and we're starting to feel the anxiety and the frustration of the world begin to break us down, we can stop and say, wait, no, 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 no. That doesn't belong to me. I'm moving at the wrong pace. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to refocus my presence on the Lord. See, some of you are way too critical of yourselves. You try to pray and you get distracted and think, oh, I'm just worthless. I can't even keep my attention on my Savior But here's the thing, you're human. You get distracted. But see, God isn't sitting there waiting for you to come back so he can slap you and be like, wow, you're so stupid. (laughs) Why can't you stay focused? Right? You laugh, but some of y'all think that. You think God is out there being like, oh, dummy. (laughs) But instead, he's excited when you return your focus back to him. Why? Because it's an opportunity for you to return to the presence of God. And he's excited about it. Oh, they're back. Hey! (laughs) He's not sitting there being like, oh, about time you came home. He's excited to see you. He loves you. It's a joy to return. See, the way of following Jesus requires a steadfast refusal to get caught up in the pace, power, and priorities of the world around us. We are called to have our lives shaped by a different kind of power, pace, and priorities offered to us by God. That's why we must grow deep, why we must be rooted in Christ, which requires us to be rooted together. See, living in this pace, though, requires us to do this crazy thing. It requires us to leave the world. Okay, it's the great paradox of following Jesus. It's only when we leave the world that we can truly be at home in it. See, we don't stay gone, though. We enter back in through a different door, a different pace, a different rhythm. We enter back in through the door of God's love and acceptance, the door of God's way of being through the one way, the one door, Jesus. And our perspective is shifting. The world might be in a hurry, but I'm not. The world might be panicking and running for the hills, but I'm not. For too long, we've masqueraded fear as wisdom. And it's not. We're scared. It's okay. Be honest. I'm scared. I need to turn my attention to Jesus. I'm rushing. I'm scrambling. When I already have the victory, I just simply need to hear his voice. I need to quiet everything else and put my focus on what is he doing? Where is he leading? Because that's where I want to go. Because I want to make maximum eternal impact. I don't want to waste my time. See, we have a limited amount of time. On this earth, we have a very limited amount of time. And we want to make it count. That doesn't mean we need to rush. That means we need to walk at his pace because it is only at his pace that we make eternal impact. Don't allow fear to speed you up. You know, I, I look at this, though. This is often kind of what this looks like as a, as a Christian. I, I call this um, starving to death in a supermarket. I want you to think about that. You're locked in a supermarket. You can't get out. It's fully stocked, and you starve to death. How ridiculous does that sound? <laughs> but we do that all the time. We're surrounded by the resources of God. We're surrounded by the power of his presence and his spirit and his word and his people. And yet we're starving, running around, saying, how do I get, huh? right? Because fear always wants to make you speed up. You ever been lost in the woods? Anybody? You ever been lost in the woods in here? Anybody? Okay, cool. We got a couple honest people. The rest of y'all probably lying. But I, I don't know about you, but when I, the, the time I got really lost in the woods, I, I don't know what it is, but when you get lost in the woods, your first instinct is to move faster. You're like, oh, God. And, you, and what are you doing? You're getting yourself more lost. But you feel like you're being productive, but you're not. (laughs) If you would just stop, get your bearings, where's the sun, right? What do they teach me in Royal Rangers? Let me remember. You know, figure all this out, right? Then you find the way out. But see, fear wants to make you speed up. I always have this thing I say, fear convinces you uh, not to put your shoes on. It speeds you up, makes you think you don't have time to put your shoes on. What are the shoes? The shoes of peace. Fear takes your peace. And without your peace, you're not firmly planted. You're running all around. 
And the enemy can push you and direct you and control you. That's the only way he can do it. That is, that's, that's it. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. This is in the message translation, which I typically don't use the message a whole lot because it's just, you know, it's just kind of kind of interesting to me at times. But <laughs> I like this passage, though, in, in the message. And it's uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 18. And it says, my counsel is this. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? Of me, I'm trying to keep the law. I'm trying to keep the law. I'm trying to keep the law. You can't. Only Jesus can. You can in him, sure. But you can't. You don't have a shot. Literally, we were so hopeless, God had to die. (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? We were such a mess. He's like, all right, well, I'm just going to have to die. That's the only option here. (laughs) That's how lost we were. So when you try to do it yourself, you ain't going to make it. Not only can we not do it outside of his strength, we can't even do it outside of community. We need each other. The Bible makes that clear from the get-go. We were never meant to be outside of God's presence, and we were never meant to be alone. From the beginning of creation, go, go read it, the beginning of Genesis. We were created in the presence of God. That is normal. Being in worship, being in the presence of God on a regular basis all the time is normal. That's how you were created. That's how we started, was in the presence of God. It was sin that took us out of that. It was sin that brought in fear. The first thing when sin breaks out into the world, the first thing we see is fear. Fear. Lies. So living freely, animated by the Spirit. Romans 12, 2 says this. Many of you know the scripture. I've already kind of referenced it. And it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. So the word world there is interesting because in the Greek, it is ion. That's the word for it. And that means it translates from, to, in English, it translates out to world, spaces of time, patterns, and the world's pace. So what I want you to understand about this is that's why most translations say the patterns of this world. Well, what is a pattern? I'm a musician. Uh, I can play drums. I, I, I play the bass much better than I play drums, but I, I can play both. But I, I like the rhythm section. I like to keep a beat, okay? So what is a pattern? Well, a pattern, different rhythms, that's a pattern. So it's saying, look, don't be conformed to the pattern, the pace of this world, the timing, the way they move, the way they think, their priorities, what's important to them, what they value, you don't. Your counter culture. We just read the, the, verse, of the, the verse previously in, in Galatians saying you can never be at home here. You will always be at odds with the pace of this world. And if you try to live by it, it's just running you into the ground. You can't keep up these paces. Why do you think high blood pressure exists? Where do you think that came from? <laughs> You're literally killing yourself. So, well, I, gotta, I just want, and if I can just make this money, and if I can just get this, and I'll just like, you'll just what? You'll die? What, 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 what is it? Is it eternal? Is it going to last forever? So what? You get the bigger house? You live in the bigger box? That's nice. What does it matter in eternity? Doing things that matter. I have never, I've, I've seen a few people on their deathbed, some people I was close to, and they never said to me, man, I wish I would have made more money. Man, I wish I'd have spent more time at work. Nope. That is, that is nothing I've ever heard on someone's deathbed. They remember their family. They remember people that mattered to them. They remember the eternal impact they remembered, they made. They remember the times of worship. They remember all the encounters they've had with the Lord and how they're about to just stand in his presence for eternity. That's what matters. 
doing things that matter, that make real impact, and we can only do that at his pace. So you understand through this verse, what is Paul telling us? He's saying don't be squeezed into the mold of this present age. Don't fall in line with their rhythms, that, and, and, and those rhythms, those patterns, they don't build anything that lasts. I'm telling you, empires have risen and fallen, and the word of God is still here. Do you realize that every enemy of the word of God, everyone, every, all of the Bible's haters have come and gone. Entire empires have risen and persecuted Jesus and the followers of Christ, and they have fallen. Where are they now? And where is the church of the living God alive and well? Prospering. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Revival is breaking out. God is moving in mighty ways. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Don't believe the lies of the media. God's moving. People are coming to Jesus. And we need to start loving people for real. Bringing them to Jesus. Showing them the good news. The real good news. That you can be forgiven. That you can be redeemed. You don't have to stay in the cycle of addiction. He is greater than that. Don't be squeezed into their rhythms. Many are falling by the wayside because they are not deeply formed in Christ, in Christ-centered community. I can't tell you how many pastors have fallen from grace, as they say, or have made mistakes, or you come to find out it was all a sham, or they were stealing money, or they were having affairs, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of seeing it. It's like we think the ministry, the, the ministry machine gets large enough that it justifies running over and damaging people. That we can leave people by the wayside. And it's okay. we got to keep, keep the ministry going. God would never justify or say that it's okay for one, for one to be damaged, to be hurt, to be wounded by the church of Jesus. I think we get our priorities out of order. We place our hope in the wrong things. We define success differently than the way God does. And a lot of trouble. See, there's this interesting fad. I, I think it's kind of silly. It's called uh, deconstruction. You ever heard of this? Deconstructing your faith. It's basically going through and dismantling everything you believe and see where it started. And, uh, and basically most of these young kids that are doing this, they're, they're realizing, I built everything on this person or this lie. And, and it's just, it's all fake. It's not real. It's, it was all emotion. It wasn't real. Right? Maybe they lead them to believe that there is no God or that's not how it works or the Bible's not true. See, if you deconstruct what you believe and you aren't left with Jesus, you built on the wrong foundation. See, I have deconstructed my faith. I have pulled it all down. And guess what I found? Jesus. A firm foundation. That will last. See, because it's an encounter with the real Jesus that changes everything. So you can't talk me out of Jesus. You can't bring an argument that even sounds reasonable, that would make me even think twice. Why? Because I have experienced him. He's changed me forever. I'm ruined. I don't belong here. <laughs> it's always about Jesus. My, I find myself drifting off as I'm driving and just thinking about Jesus and his goodness and what he's done for me. And how he's been faithful, even when I wasn't. You ever think about that? The times when you weren't faithful and he still was? What a good God we serve. We should always be left with the foundation of Jesus. See, we live in this social media age. And the danger of this is that we have gotten very good at presentation. We have gotten very good at putting up a front. The gift of presentation, as I like to call it. And if we aren't careful, we become really good at presentation, but lack seriously in character and true depth. We're good at presenting something. We look the part, but we, we're not really matching up. There's no depth there. We're not rooted. See, the Galatians dealt with this. Paul writes to the Galatians, and, and he's speaking of the trouble of this cosmetic Christianity, that it looks good on the outside, but on the inside, you don't have anything. It's just paint over bad problems and bad foundations. I mean, you, you bought a house recently. Housing market's great, but you're looking around, buying houses, selling houses. You ever gone into a house that's been flipped and you're kind of wondering, what are they hiding? <laughs> you're like, wow, I smell fresh paint here. Something's wrong. <laughs> what, what's, what are they hiding? How's the foundation, right? Isn't that always the first question? How's the foundation? It should be. If not, you need to get you a parent or an adult to go with you looking at houses. How's the foundation? 
Because, see, it won't matter how pretty the house looks if it falls off. If I'm sleeping in it one night and it falls over. <laughs> won't matter then. Paint ain't going to hold it up. <laughs> right? I want to know what it's built on because I, I can fix all this. It's the foundation. What is it built on? That's important. And the Galatians were having this problem. And Paul writes to them. He says, I'm amazed. In Galatians 1, 6 or 7, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And see what was being taught by these people that were distorting the gospel of Christ? It was, it was being taught that it wasn't faith, that faith alone in Jesus just wasn't enough. You needed to make sure you checked all the traditions off in the box. You need to make sure you were keeping all of these certain rules, some of which they made up. And if you believe in Jesus and do these things, you will be the people of God. If you do this, you will prove yourself to be properly formed. And to this, Paul says, no, we're not formed from the outside in. We're formed from the inside out. Jesus calls the Pharisees on this multiple times. The Pharisees who spent their entire life studying the word of God can't even recognize the living word when he's talking to them. That's what religion looks like. It doesn't look like love. So he's talking about this. That's not how it works. If Jesus multiple times would say to the Pharisees, he'd call them whitewashed tombs. He said, well, you cleaned up the tombstone. Looks real nice, but you're dead. He even would, would, would make fun of him some. And he says, he says man, who, who cleans the outside of a cup and then drinks out of it? First you clean the inside. Don't matter what the outside looks like. Hey, what you're drinking out of? And we laugh because we think that's ridiculous, but yet we try that. We do that when we try to get in our own strength and we try to make things happen for ourselves instead of trusting in his goodness, his strength, and his will and where he's leading. That's what it looks like. Religion's gross. <laughs> matters. It's a waste. I'm closing with this. So there's this psalm that I, that I enjoy, and, and you're actually getting a little sneak peek. I'm actually preaching this to the last part of this series. I haven't preached it to my church yet, but um, so don't tell them. <laughs> Hopefully nobody's watching this on the live stream. Uh, so I love the first psalm. Um, I, I just, I love the first psalm. It's not very long, and it is different than every other psalm. It's not a prayer, and it's not a song. It's a statement about life, and it's profound. It really is. But see, there's this, this, this thing, and he talks about this tree of life. And I love the first part of psalm because just like so much in the Bible, it all takes us back to Genesis. In the very beginning, God's original design, there was this massive, powerful, beautiful tree of life. That if you ate from, you had eternal life. That it had everything you needed. And as we know, we've fallen from there. We're no longer in the garden. And then here comes Jesus, our new tree of life. And he dies on a cross for our sins. And it says if we come to him, we have everything we need. He is our tree of life. So here at the beginning of the first psalm, David kicks us off kind of tying that back into this tree of life theme. But he says this, he says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not walk in the ways of the wicked or the pace of the wicked, does not walk in their ways, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers or something I like to call the scorner's seat. Meantime, we have a lot of people that like to sit in the scorner's seat. They like to gossip. They like to complain. They like to mock and see, David here is very clearly saying, this is not something the righteous do. This is not somebody that is rooted in love in Jesus. This is not what they do. In fact, this is a table that if Jesus were to walk in, he would flip it over. And yet some of us desire a seat at that table to be a part of that group that just wants to complain about everything. It's always got a problem, being critical of everyone. You know, I say this a lot, but I found the closer I get to Jesus, the less critical of people I become. The closer I get to Jesus the less critical of people I've become. Because I realize how good he is and how much grace he has for me. I don't, I'm not going to sit in judgment of somebody else. Well, you can tell them by their fruit, sure. But I want to get them rooted where they can start growing some real fruit. I want to direct them in love. I want to empower them, not criticize them, not tear them down with my words because my words matter and they have power. Nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. In the word of God. Even, man, even in our Bible reading. Man, if I can just cram seven books today, and then seven tomorrow, and then three the next day. And then, and then if I just do a little more, and if I stay up all night, I've read the entire Bible and I'm done for the year. 
And like, you're getting nothing. You're just, you're reading, you're reading, you, nothing's happening. See, I want you to understand the book of the, the, the Bible, even the literary form it's written is, is meant for you to meditate on. It's meant for you to read some and sit with it. Because see, you don't actually read the Bible. The Bible reads you. <laughs> when you sit with the Bible and you meditate on the scripture and God's word to do something to you. You begin to read and you begin to co contemplate it and you begin to pray about it and you begin to speak it and then you begin to say, wait, how do I walk in this, Jesus? Empower me to live this way that you're calling me to live. And what does this do for my community? How does this, how do I bring this into my church family and how does it improve things and make things better and make it look more like you? And I got all that from one verse. Guys, we got, we're, we're, we're in verse one right now, Psalm 1-1. One, one. And some of y'all like, I read the Bible in a year. That's... That's great. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. That's awesome. Read the whole Bible. Sure. Especially when you read it, you get the kind of systematic theology context of it. That's wonderful. But listen, the Bible is meant to be sat with and to meditate on. And he says, this is something the righteous do. This is what keeps us rooted. This is what creates this life in Jesus that looks so different. It says his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Other translations say it will yield fruit in seasons of drought. It is rooted to a source that never runs dry. Even when the world around it is a barren desert, there is still fruit on this tree. Do you understand right now in this time of turmoil and chaos what it speaks to unbelievers, people that don't walk with Jesus, when everybody else looks like a hot mess and they turn around and they look at you and they say, look at all that fruit on that tree. What's different about them? Why aren't they freaking out? What's different about them? Well, I'm connected to the source, the source that never runs dry. Its leaf does not wither and whatever he does, he prospers. Whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assemblies of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What does this mean? It might look like they're doing good, but they're not. It's like I told you, everybody that's not on Team Jesus, they're fighting to be the first loser. That's it. She's saying the world, hey, what's going on? What's going to happen? What does Revelation tell us? And, and what are, are the locusts? Are those Apache helicopters? And what, what's going on? I would tell you this. You have a mission. And you can be at rest in the midst of turmoil and strife. Why? Because you're rooted. You might move a little when the wind blows, but you ain't going anywhere. You're rooted. Do you believe that Jesus is more powerful than what's going on in our world? But do we really believe it? Because we look at things sometimes, and I, and I think our behavior is telling. We panic. We ah. And the beautiful thing is, is God doesn't look at you saying, wow, well, what a dummy. Look at him hiding again. He comes, and he lovingly gets on our level. Just like you would when you're correcting a child, at least you should. Get on their level. Say, hey, sweetie, it's okay. Come on out of there. I'm here. You're not. You're not in danger. I got you. A nice, gentle reminder. Some of you feeling that right now. You're in a situation, and you just, all of a sudden, it's going to be okay. All right, this is the presence of God. I just want to pray over you, and then I'm going to turn this back over. Um, but I want to encourage you. Slow down to catch up to God. Focus on things that matter. Be truly rooted. And that, that includes being rooted in this wonderful community of believers that you have here. If this is the church God has led you to, if this is the church you call home, man, go deep. Go deep. Don't allow strife and frustration to, to make you leave. I know how it works in charismatic churches, man. I grew up in a charismatic church. People would leave and say, well, it's the spirit of Jezebel drove me out. Really? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> We always have some deep spiritual reason of why we didn't want to stick it out. I always used to make this joke in ministry. It's actually kind of a joke a lot of pastors make usually, but uh, uh, it's that God, God rarely, the Spirit rarely leads you to a pay decrease. <laughs> always leads you to a pay increase. Praise God. <laughs> well, it's the Lord. <laughs> it's being stuck in this and being committed and being rooted in Jesus. Oh, man. 
I feel like I'm hearing myself talk. This is amazing. It's the Lord speaking. <laughs> gotcha. It's <laughs> awesome. Being rooted in community, not being distracted. No, that's awesome. <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, I've talked enough. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. God, I pray that even though the world is shaking, that things that aren't truly built on you are falling, that we don't have to fear because we are built on the firm foundation of Jesus. I pray for the one in here that maybe is fearful. Maybe they've become distracted by the pace of this world. Maybe they've been caught up in the patterns of this world and they're realizing it. Lord, I pray right now they would just repent. Lord, forgive us for getting distracted. We repent. Lord, change our minds. Renew our thinking. Give us your perspective, Jesus. God, you have all the time in the world. Why are we in a hurry? Lord, you have plans, Lord, and we want to be a part of them. Lord, we want to be a friend of God. I don't want to just be a tool used, but I want to be a friend. So Lord, I thank you that I can trust in you and that even in seasons of drought, I can bear fruit. God, I don't want a seat at the scorner's table. I don't want to be critical of people. God, I want to love people for real. God, teach me how to love better because you are love. Lord, I pray that I would love you more. God, and in doing so, you would empower me to live the way you've called me to live because it's only by your strength. So, girl, God, I pray we just, we just slow down. We slow down and we catch up to you. Lord, we just walk closely with you and we would be rooted deeply in your word and we would be rooted with one another like the redwoods, that we would be connected so that we could grow tall and truly point our community to Jesus, truly be a lighthouse, a light on a hill, a city on a hill pointing to you, Jesus, our tree of life. Lord, thank you for grafting us in. We could have never earned it. God, we were a hot mess and you saved us. You delivered us. You picked us up. You dusted us off. You cleaned us up. You washed our feet. You gave us purpose. You gave us a community of people that love you and that love us. God, we're so grateful. God, I pray we would stop trying to live life alone and we would live it in true community and at your pace. And I thank you for it. And I bless these people, everyone on watching online or who may watch later. Lord, I pray you would just bless them mightily that they would experience your love in a real, tangible, and powerful way, and they would be changed forever. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap for Matthew Hemerski, please? Thank you. Let's stand together. Let's stand together just one, one last time. And as Bethany leads us in a in a, in a little song, let's just let's just give a little bit of worship to the Lord. Let's practice presence, amen. Let's practice that presence, Father. I just thank you, thank you, Jesus, for who you are, and Father, I just ask that as we spend this moment with you, Lord, that it would just be the beginning of a new discipline in our lives. We will learn to practice your presence. And we will acknowledge you everywhere that we go. Father, I pray that as we leave this place, that your Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us. presence tonight, church. We acknowledge you, Lord. Father, thank you for teaching us a new pace. Let's just honor his presence for just a minute, church.
you, Jesus. He's in this place.
trust is Jesus, church. He's proven himself. He's good to us. Father, as we leave this place, let us walk in love with you. Let us show this world the light of who you are. We love you, Lord. Bless this congregation as we leave. And let us dig in deeper into you, your presence this week, Father. I pray for our pastors, Lord, that you keep them, that you speak to them, that you strengthen them, Father. Let your grace be sufficient in their lives. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. The church said, amen. Good night, church. God bless you.